Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Today is uh, day four of the Macro Finance Society Virtual Summer School. Uh, we're very happy to have Dimitris Papanikolaou from Northwestern University today. Dimitri is going to talk to us about innovation and asset prices. Uh, just to let you know how the, uh, the, the meeting will go, uh, we're going to um, take questions in the chat. So if you have questions, just type them in the chat, and then we'll pause occasionally and give you an opportunity to, um, to have that question answered. Um, uh, feel free to also use the raise hand feature, and then we can also call on you as well. Um, we will take a, two breaks, um, uh, about one hour apart. Um, and uh, other than that, um, um, the floor is yours, Dimitris. Take it away. Great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for everyone for sticking it out for another day. Um, so my plan for today is I want to talk a little bit broadly about how to think about technology shocks and asset prices. Um, that's sort of the first part of the talk. That's stuff that I've thought about this uh, earlier on. And then I want to talk a little bit about some of my new year work that tries to think about what makes intangibles different from physical capital. And here I want to think about intangibles as some type of accumulated stock of knowledge that the firm owns or at least owns a claim on. And how is that different than when the firm, than uh, if the firm owns a machine? Okay, so going to asset prices, here's uh, some motivation for this, which is over the last 30 years, uh, there's a voluminous asset pricing literature that has uncovered a number of stylized facts. And these are relatively robust. So fact number one is there's a collection of firm characteristics that predict returns. And that typically happens controlling for market beta. So you have two firms that have similar market betas, and then they have different characteristics, say book to market, and that tends to predict returns going forward. That's one. Um, What's actually more interesting to me about this is that these characteristics are actually associated with excess co movement as well. That is, if you were to take these portfolios of firms that are sorted on these characteristics and you were to completely hedge out the market return, that residual actually tends to be correlated. That is, value firms tend to be correlated with the other value firms, even net of the market return. And the same is true for growth firms. So growth firms tend to co-move with other growth firms, even if you were to um, to remove the, the the market return part of it. So then there's a long debate in this literature about whether these facts are driven by mispricing, some correlated sentiment shocks, or by some missing risk factor. Now, I think that's a debate that's very hard to settle without putting models on the table. Um, and I think one way to, set, to kind of think about this debate is to take a step back and think through what could these factors potentially be such that these firms are differentially exposed to even once you net out the market return. So I'm gonna talk about one of possibility, which is uh, as the rate of innovation changes over time, you have new technologies replacing old technologies. And I'm going to discuss a little bit about how that could rationalize some or a subset of these patterns. OK, so before we start, I think it's helpful to think about the firm, and by that I mean the entire firm, including debt and equity, as being a portfolio or a combination of two things. So the first part is their firm has typically some existing operations, some existing product line, some existing business. So the value of the cash flows associated with that, with those existing product lines, I'm going to call it assets in place. And just to be clear, this could also include tangible assets, but also intangible assets. So for example, Apple is a large firm. It's mostly comprised of intangibles, but I would say that's a firm that has a lot of assets in place. At the same time, you might think that part of the value, part of what you get if you buy the firm today, you're also buying a claim to its future investment opportunities. And by that, I mean the firm is going to take some positive NPV projects in the future. These things add value to shareholders. So at time zero, you're also buying a claim of that. So I'm going to call that the value of growth opportunities. So how would these firms behave? So all else equal, you would think that firms that have a lot of growth opportunities relative to their assets in place are likely to invest more going forward. They're likely to grow faster going forward. 
all else sequel, they're going to have lower reported profitability simply because if most of the value comes from things that haven't occurred yet, you're just going to simply fewer cash flows. To the extent that book values don't incorporate growth opportunities, and they don't, you would expect that these firms also have higher market to book ratios. And also, to some extent, that if you think that these growth opportunities are associated with significantly more uncertainty than cash flows from existing projects, you might also expect to see that these firms are riskier in a more idiosyncratic sense. Interestingly enough, these are all characteristics that are associated with lower future returns. That is, if you run a regression of future returns on these characteristics, either individually or combined, you typically find that many of them, I mean, many of them are highly collinear, but either individually or a combination of them tends to be associated with lower returns going forward. Okay, and that's typically also including for the market, controlling for the market. And that's important because maybe some of these firms are actually, so these characteristics are actually associated with higher market betas. So, here's how to think about this. And here's how to uh, think through whether uh, the extent to which technology can help you understand these facts. So, Here's one way to think about technology is like it's a two distinct views if you want. So in the traditional sort of standard view where technology is such a, just a TFP shock, then it just comes from as mana from the skies that you're sitting around, there's some capital installed, there's some labor installed, and then it gets hit by a productivity shock. And then suddenly everything gets better. All the capital magically gets better, labor becomes more productive. So then it's basically effectively the same thing as an endowment shock. Okay, so in that view of technology, whether you model the factors of production endogenously or you just assume it's some exogenous dividend process, you basically get nothing very different. A slightly different view of technology is that the way progress works is by having better types of capital. And by capital here, I, can, I mean both tangibles and intangibles, by the way. That is, it could include a better machine, but also a better production process. And this is a view that goes back to Solo, um, who basically back in 1960 made the point that, you know, much of many of these innovations, they don't just magically appear, they actually need to embody in new types of cap capital. And he was mostly talking about physical capital, but I think the same insight applies to intangibles. And the point was that these improvements in technology, they only affect output to the extent that they're actually implemented and transformed into physical capital. And typically what happens, there's a replacement effect, which is the old capital gets replaced by newer capital. Okay, so I wanna contrast these two standard views. And I think there's an element of both coming on, although I would probably argue that what TFP shocks measure uh, is uh, probably something like the residual. It's like these other shocks that hit the economy that are not really associated with technological progress. Okay, so if you think much of technology improvements are actually embodied in new types of capital, and again, I'm gonna lump everything together. I'm gonna include intangible assets and possibly including human capital in that equation. Um, what you expect to see is that once there's a lot of technological improvements, the value of assets in place will decline simply because of the replacement effect. That is, if you have a firm that has a better production process or a better product, or just simply has access to better physical assets than the existing firms, the value of the existing firms will fall. And then to the extent that some of these firms can actually take advantage of these technologies going forward, and again, we can debate why can or cannot everyone do the same thing, you would expect that the value of growth opportunities will increase, at least in a relative sense, relative to the assets in place. So now what you have is you have a mechanism that drives a wedge between these two parts of the firm. That is, all else equal, as you have improvements in technology, the value of assets in place will fall, whereas the value of growth opportunities, at least in a relative sense, will rise. And here's a few examples. So back in the day, we used to transport things in the US using canals. That's why a lot of uh, cities, including Chicago, is actually built uh, with close access to water. 
And then suddenly you have a new technology, railroads, that doesn't actually need uh, canals. You can basically build a railroad almost everywhere. And then what happened then is that these railroads rapidly displaced uh, water transportation. Okay. Now, in turn, railroads themselves were displaced by automobiles. Uh, and the car had several advantages relative to the railroad. It doesn't, it doesn't need a pre-existing track. It can drive it almost everywhere. Um, so then what happened to railroads? Well, back in the 1900s, roughly half of all traded firms on IC in terms of market cap were railroads. Today, they account for less than 2%. Well, actually, so by 75, they accounted for less than 2% uh, of the market cap of NICE. And this is not just the effect of the transportation sector has declined because you had entry of new firms. It's just even within the transportation sector, basically the value of railroad firms accounted for almost nothing. But it started by being 60% of all transportation firms or railroads. And by over the next 50 years or so, that value dropped essentially to zero. Okay, and to be clear, this is not just physical assets that can get displaced. The same is also true for intangibles. So I don't know if you guys were old enough to remember this, but we used to have phones like this. Now we all have phones like this, and that's significantly better. Uh, and another example is uh, medallions. If you're in New York City, back in the day, you would take a cab, which made these medallion licenses extremely valuable. Think of them as this is a, a license to earn future rents. And what happened when Uber arrived is that the value of those rents declined. So as I just, you can see what happened to the value of medallions, they basically dropped by over 50% uh, since Uber arrived. So the point here being that existing assets that utilize the old technology, and these assets again could be physical or intangibles, can get displaced as new technologies arrive. Now, I think it's important to also think of, to incorporate these intangible assets in our view of assets in place. So this is some recent work that I've done with Andrea. Um, and actually several other people have documented the same thing, which is people have argued that HML has quote, stopped working since uh, early 2000s. Well, yes and no. And the point in that paper is that much of it is actually driven by the fact that the book value of equity has become an increasingly poor measure of assets in place. That is, if you adjust that for some measures of intangibles, you actually see that that intangible adjusted HML does significantly better. And in fact, I would argue that its performance post 2000 doesn't look significantly worse than the performance pre 2000. Anyway, that's just a minor point. Okay, so here's what I wanna discuss next. I wanna talk a little bit about how do I think about measuring these things in the data? Because it's easy to write models where these things happen in the background, but I think ultimately any test of theory has to come to reality. And these objects are actually quite hard to measure, right? How do you measure ideas? How do you measure innovation? And then once we have a set of facts, then we can think about how to model them. Um, so I'm gonna go through one or two models that help drive these ideas home and help you think through a, how are these facts rationalized in the context of these models? And what does this depend on? What do I need to assume about the world, household preferences for this pattern to emerge? Dimitri, in that picture, do you have a sense of what happened in the, around 2000? Um, is that the- This thing or- They really separate what- uh, good, I don't know. Just don't the know end of- the end of dot com or something like that it's really striking yeah it's very stark i'm not sure what exactly is driving this what's the one on the right versus the one on the left um uh, it's just i think there are different versions of the intangible okay the or just might be a different time period actually it, it seems like it, it would be interesting to do this in in COVID too because as you were yeah. showing the railroads and the iphone and all that i was thinking there have been a lot of examples of the same thing now with you know the last couple of years also like all the electric vehicles um, right 
displacing the the internal combustion engine and they're just there's just tons of examples like that more recently. That, that's exactly right i mean i think one can find plenty of examples i think the challenge is to try to find these patterns more broadly in the data in a way that's i don't know what the right word is uh broad or less uh, example dependent so to speak or systematic right yeah Absolutely. so i think that's 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 what the challenge is and i'm going to walk you through some thoughts I've had, and then I think there's a lot of work left to be done. And I think it would be interesting to uh, hear everyone else's thoughts too. Um, so let me pause for 10 seconds, if anyone has any questions, just because it's hard to ask questions on Zoom. And if there's any, nothing. Any questions, feel free to jump in. You can unmute yourself. Give it a second. Okay, so then let's just right. jump right in. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about measurement. How do I find evidence for these patterns in the data uh, without relying on very specific examples? So one place to start uh, is patterns. It's not necessarily the only way to start, but that's one way of start for sure. And why is that a natural starting point? Well, by definition, a patent relates to a new invention. That is, it's true that not all valuable inventions are patented or even patentable, but by construction, a patent relates to something that's new. You have to indicate to the US Patent Office that your invention has some novelty and utility. So it's a useful place to start. Another useful reason to focus on patents is that they actually measure output, not inputs. So as you probably know from working on your papers, output is not perfectly correlated with the amount of effort you put in. Okay, sometimes there's uh, this significant uncertainty in the idea creation process, which is why you wanna to try to measure the output of that process as opposed to the inputs, that is the amount of R&D effort that's being devoted to this. And it's actually important also if you think the productivity of R&D has changed over time, that is if you think that there are some type of decreasing returns overall, and that's what's driving slow growth, that's also a useful way to think to, that's another reason why you want to think directly about outputs. Now, here's an example of a pattern that I think is pretty useful. Uh, I think transportation would be very different without it. That's a, one of the, this is the, the patent for the airplane. Okay, it's one of, it's basically a patent that's issued to uh, the Wright brothers back in 1906. And what it has is it has a description of that invention. Here's another one that I thought was pretty useful too. Uh, it's the patent for the first semiconductor. Okay, so it's a it's issued to David Noyce, and this happened in 1961. So these patents have a wealth of information there. Notice that you can date the invention, and then there's also a long description of what the invention actually does. So in principle, there's a lot of what you could do with this. Here's another one. Google PageRank, that was also pretty useful. Um, this is 2001. Now, the problem though is that not every patent is equally useful as those. I mean, these are all obviously cherry picked examples. In some cases, you have patents like this. So I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember, but uh, Michael Jackson was actually able to patent the shoes that he used in Moonwalk. And you could argue that they're not exactly as useful as a patent for uh, a CPU or uh, airplane. Between the two, I think I would probably, I would attach different weights into them. And then part of the issue now is that the US Patent Paul, the, the US Patent Office has actually shifted the way, the process for granting patents. So post 1980, it became significantly easier to get a patent. Uh, it's not automatic, of course. I mean, there are many patents applications still get rejected, but definitely there's a shift in standards. So then if you just go out and count patents, this is gonna basically get you nowhere, okay? So you wanna think a little bit about trying to identify which are the patents that you think are more valuable than others. And then you can take a step back and ask the question, what do you think value comes from? What exactly makes an innovation valuable? So 
one way to do this, and again, there are many other ways to think about it, is you could argue like, look, an invention is valuable, first of all, if it's actually inventive, if it's novel. If it doesn't copy an existing idea and it's somewhat distinct from existing ideas, you would argue that that's probably useful or potentially useful. At the same time, not all the new ideas are good. Uh, so you typically want to measure some measure of impact or usefulness of that innovation. Like other people are using it in some way. And ideally, what you want to do is you want to combine these two in a single metric. You want to say, look, these innovations that were very new at that time, and subsequently, there's a lot of innovations that either build on them or they are particularly, they to kind of use that as an input. And again, many of these innovations, for example, the moonwalk were either, were neither novel nor useful. So here's an example of an innovation that's not novel. Um, the one on the left is a drug called Prilosec. The one on the right is a drug called Nexium. They're both patented by AstraZeneca. If you remember your high school chemistry class, you'll notice that the chemical structure between these two drugs is actually very, very, very close. And the reason for that is that they're essentially the same drug. So what AstraZeneca did is as the patent for Prilosec was expiring, he made a small tweak to the patent and then patented Nexium, which is just like the old drug, except that now it has another patent for 20 years. Okay, so you could argue this was particularly helpful to AstraZeneca, but I don't think this was a innovation that changed the world in any way. And here's another example of a use, not so useful patent. So Stephen Olson, who's age seven, uh, his dad is a patent attorney, attorney, and then they patented the uh, method for swing and swing. Okay, so it's, plenty, it's easy to find these uh, examples of silly patents. The question is, can we identify this in a systematic way? So one way to do this would be to just count citations. And the idea there is that if a patent receives a lot of citations, just like a paper, then it has to be somehow a useful patent. Uh, so that's a useful place to start. Now let's try to think if we can validate this. So if that were a useful measure of how valuable a patent is, then all little SQL, you would expect to see that firms that have a lot of patents that have received a lot of citations should all else equal be worth more. That is, this firm should have all else equal higher valuation ratios to the extent that these patents are indeed more valuable. So people have been doing this for some time. Uh, probably the earliest reference I could find is Bronwyn Hall's paper with Adam Jaffe and Michelle Trachtenberg. So what these guys do is they basically look at pa firms' patent portfolios, and then they weigh them differently based on how many sites the patents of that portfolio have. Now, when you do this, of course, you wanna adjust for this mechanical relation between age and citations, that is the older the patent is, will mechanically have more citations. Okay, so you wanna be careful a little bit about that. Um, so when you do this, that is, if you run a cross, if you run a series of cross-sectional regressions of some measure of market to book uh, on these uh, capitalized patent portfolios, what you basically see is that uh, if you capitalize R and D, that is correlated with market values. If you just count patents, controlling for R and D, there's no effect. But if on top of that you try to add touch higher weight to patents that have more citations, then again, you find a cross-sectional relation between these patent portfolios and valuation ratios. So you for mean, a long time- is it, yeah. is it trivial to match a patent to a firm? Like how do you, I miss that step. Um, so in the patent document, um, there's um, information that basically says who it's assigned to. Um, let me find one. So let's take this, uh, this pattern for a semiconductor. There's a firm name there. I see. So then one has to do some work. It's not trivial um, to go and match the patent to a firm, but you can do it at least based on the name. Now, of course, people run into some issues, which is 
what about subsidiaries? How do you think about those? Sometimes patents have multiple SINEs. Mm -hmm. So it's not trivial, but people have done this. Uh, it's easier to do this for public firms, obviously, because we have a set of firm names that are more publicly available, but um, there's efforts by several people, including me, to try to create a more broad match to uh, a more broader set of firms that goes back in time as well. And if Robert Noyes uh, leaves Fairchild, they still own the patent, is that? Fairchild, yeah. So what this basically says is that the Robert Noyes has assigned all the, patter, all the patent ra uh, rights to Fairchild. Got it. And that's typically the agreement that you write. So for example, you, if you patent something, as part of your employment agreement with NYU, you have assigned all the rights to that patent to NYU. Right. It's not like at least it, that's the case for me. But it, it's it's somehow not true for papers, but for patents. No, it's definitely not true for papers. Thankfully. But the idea is that you're using the firm's resources to do this, so then the firm owns the patent. That's the agreement that you have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but of course, some, anyone can file a patent, regardless of whether they worked for a firm or not. So Michael Jackson, basically, he filed a patent and then assigned the, the, the rights to his own company. Mm -hmm. okay? But it actually, you don't actually need to have an SINE. You could just retain the rights itself. And actually, the interesting thing that happened over time is before 1900s, um, most patent rights were assigned to the original inventor. That is, there was no such thing as the SINE. That's a more recent phenomenon, which coincides with the rise of uh, corporate America. Mm. Hey, there's a question in the chat. Would, would it be a good time to ask? Richard? Uh, yeah, why don't you ask it? Richard, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? If not, yeah, I can I'll ask this one. Um, the book value, I mean, which is the equity value of a, uh, of a firm on the books, um, you know, that's Got Sorry, that, that's that's a uh, book assets. Case, Sorry. However, the intangible assets of a firm are normally the patented elements. If you if you exclude a couple other, uh, uh, if you exclude a, a few other things, that that's um, uh, and therefore comparing uh, it against the book value rather than the uh, 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 rather than say the pat uh, the patented elements on the accounts, which are the intangibles. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's a reasonable comparison. Well, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm trying to do, right? I'm basically saying these intangible. So, by the way, this is book assets, not book equity. Um, so, book what assets. this is basically saying is that this as if to the extent that these are actually intangible assets that should show up in market values, since, yeah. as you okay. said, they don't show up in in in, um, in book assets. So that's precisely the reason for doing this exercise. Okay, yeah, that's, that's all right. I just, uh, I, I just want to be very clear about uh, the- Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you. That's, that's exactly what I'm doing this, right? Because it's basically saying to the extent that you see differences across firms in the ratio of market to book, and that difference is correlated with differences in how many sites their patent portfolio has, that is suggestive that part of that differences in market to book values is due to these citations. Obviously, it doesn't prove anything, right? It's a it's a cross sectional correlation. Let's be very clear here, uh, but it's suggested at least. Do we have a sense of the magnitudes here? Like, what is the point one? Yeah, so these are no, these are normalized to set to, to like a unit of standard deviation, and what this basically is saying is that a one standard deviation change change in this cross sectional uh, stock of mm -hmm. patent adjusted citations is, leads to a uh, point 0.1 uh, log point increase in the market to book ratio. That, the left hand side is a, is a log. Sorry, it's a, these are uh, this is running logs. Yeah. Okay. Um, notice also that this cross section relation has become weaker over time, and partly this is due to the fact that you're tr as you're truncating the sample, citations become less informative. But also possibly it's just a, just a very imperfect measure of of, uh, of quality, which firms have begun to game in a particular way. So you may not be shocked to find out that just like papers, paper citations, also people game uh, patent citations. That firms, when they file for a patent, they're very strategic uh, 
uh, in how this site existing work. So there's actually a proliferation of citations. And then one theory about what is happening is people try to hide um, prior inventions that are very related to what they're doing by just you know, including a large number of weekly related citations. Okay, mm. just like academic papers. Okay, um, so there's a number of reasons, again, you might wanna think these patent citations are in, in, imperfect. Uh, another one is just they're just not always available. That is, the patent office has started recording them consistently only since the 40s or so. Uh, and to the extent that you want to think about things like in the long run, you might want to think about alternatives. So another thing one could do, and that's something I thought about a bit, is try to replicate if you want or capture the idea behind what a citation should be that is you're citing prior work and ideally what you do is you cite the most novel part of the prior work you don't you cite you cite the first paper you don't cite the tenth paper in the literature um but try to replicate something like this using textual analysis so remember what i said was that i i think what we should try to measure is novelty and impact so one can, to create, one can try to create measures of novelty and impact using text analysis. So in that view, a patent that's novel would be one whose text is distinct from prior patents. And one that's impactful would be one that is related to subsequent patents. Okay, so if you have a patent document right there and then the closest patent is very far, but there's a lot of patents that are very near, you would argue that this is necessary or this is likely to be an impactful patent. Okay. Now, of course, how exactly you measure distance, there's all these different ways to do this, but the literature on text analysis and machine learning has come up with a number of interesting approaches. We use one probably not the most sophisticated. Uh, this is a paper with Brian, uh, Amit, and Matt. And here's what came out of it, which is we, we, we took this idea and then we tried to do uh, something similar to one can do with citations. That is create a measure, a single number that summarizes the patent's novelty and impact. And then I did the same exercise I did before and then what you're seeing is that uh, it basically does about as well as citations to the same sample. But one advantage of it is that one can go back all the way down to 1850 uh, and try to identify important patents. So what you're seeing is that these innovations, these very important patents over time, we call these breakthrough innovations in that paper, have become clustered across different industries. So earlier on, back uh, in the late 19th century, uh, much of these important patents were in essentially manufacturing. Some of it is in agriculture. Uh, but over time, you see uh, chemicals, plastics, etc., becoming more important, electricity. And then towards the end of the sample, you see the ICT. Uh, so what the one on the right, what you're saying is basically a share of these breakthrough inventions, how it varied across uh, different industries. And then you see the, the, the large impact that the ICT has had. So these are ranked by novelty or impact or some combination? Like it's, the, it's a combination of, so to be specific, what it is, it's you create a, a combined metric. Think of it as impact, combining impact times novelty. And then you count the patents on the right tail of that distribution. And then you date them by when they're uh, granted. So yeah. what this is saying is that during this period, many of these breakthrough patents were related to furniture, textiles, and apparel. So there's no sense that one that like impact is more important than novelty or the other way around. 
you need both that's that's yeah you need both it's a combination of both um now the question is what makes you you know how did you is there some type of validation for this so what we did is we you know absent any other measure of quality at least that's broadly available for all patents what we did is we try to see whether this object correlates with citations and what we found is that a particular combination that works best in predicting citations in sample. So then we went and kind of backward applied it to the entire history. So you think of it as a measure of a synthetic citation, if you will. There is a question in the chat. Charles, do you want to ask your question? Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, so on the regression you showed in the previous slide, I was wondering, if the coefficient on the patent portfolio, either kind of as, as measured by novelty and impact or by citations, um, if that coefficient changed much when you were restricted to expired patents, uh, it seems like the value of the patent should suddenly drop after 20 years or whenever the patent expires. And yeah, so good point. Kind of what that um, good question. I think there's some implicit version of this because you have you're assuming some type of depreciation over time but you're right that depreciation is not smooth it has to be uh it's it's uh this it's, it's discrete so i agree if someone should do this and then instead of kind of assuming this thing smoothly depreciate over time which again it's not a terrible assumption to the extent that you think other people are coming in and then uh, they're taking some of their rents away but what could look at a very discrete change um what happens right before and right after the patent i mean it seems like it's not a discontinuity there it's just a kink and, and you right yeah it's a, they, there's, there's a discrete before, change one day before it expires it has one day of value and the day after it has zero so it doesn't right well it's not smooth it has a kink but it's no, you're right you and, but i think it might also there's some industries where i think this might even be more important than others and i think probably biotech is one mm -hmm. Uh, but I think that's, I haven't seen anyone do this and look at what happens to these things are out patent expirations. So I think that could be useful. Real nice test. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, actually Alex is right. It would be smooth because simply because uh, market values are forward looking. Okay. So now these two things that I talked about, these are all, these are things that just use the patent document as itself or how the patent document relates to other patent documents. Um, one could try to do something slightly more direct by linking the patent to a firm. Okay, and again, as Alexis said, there's a lot of uh, imperfections in that process because you have to go and figure out which, who exactly owns the right of the patent and then how do you think about subsidiaries? And then some many of these patents are actually not owned by public firms. So you cannot do this exercise for them. But at least for the ones that are, uh, you can try to see what happens to the price of the firm on the day the patent is issued. So that's an exercise I did with uh, Leonid, Amit, and Noah. So here's an example. So GenX is a small biotech firm. And then what happens is that they get suddenly a patent, a breakthrough patent uh, for uh, whatever this thing is. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not a biologist. Uh, and then what happens basically is that over the next few days after the patent is issued, both volume spikes, but also uh, the stock price jumps. So our idea in that paper was motivated by examples like this. Let's try to infer how valuable the patent was based on how big the change in the stock price in dollar terms was, or more precisely, the change in market value. So that's what we did. Uh, interestingly enough, that dollar change, you might think it's just noise, but actually, no, it actually predicts the number of citations that particular patent will receive. Okay, because remember what happens is citations start accumulating after the patent application is out there. The moment the patent is issued, what you're seeing is that patents for which 
the stock market chains was larger, tend to accumulate more citations. And also, interestingly enough, the same correlation we found with our novelty measure, with, with our, sorry, with our um, patent quality measure, the combination of novelty and impact. So patents in firms that experience a larger change in market values actually end up being more impactful going forward. Now, of course, you could say to the extent that these two measures are correlated, that the extent to which similarities correlate with citations, that's not, they're not really different results, but they are kind of together, they at least convince us that this is not just pure stock market noise. Okay, so now what do you do with this? Well, now what you can do is at least for these publicly traded firms, try to create a stock of what was the value of innovation that they generate in a particular year. So then what we did is we took this dollar values for a firm, we summed them up in a single year, we scaled them by either assets or market values. And then what we found is subsequently firms that had a lot of valuable patents experience a growth in profits going forward. Okay. And there was no kind of visible pre-trend in that sense. So obviously these things are all endogenous, but at least in terms of, uh, you know, consider it sort of grand, uh, granger causes profits. That is um, all that sequel firms that experienced that saw a rise in valuable innovations in a given year tended to be more profitable going forward. And the magnets are not small. Uh, so this is the response of one certain deviation increase is associated with roughly 8% increase in profits going forward. This is what happens when other firms in the same industry as you have valuable patents, controlling for how much innovation you do. What are you saying is a reverse effect? So when other firms in the industry have these valuable patents, you experience a decline in profits of about 6%. Okay, and again, there is no obvious pre-trends before. So, now we have a measure that we can use it for models that tells us something about how much valuable innovation was generated by a firm in a given year. So that's gonna be an object that we can think about when we sit down and we write models, how can we use that model? How can we use that object to discipline the model? We have a question in the chat. Slide 28, yeah, go for it. Carlo, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, well, uh, yeah, in slide 28, um, for example, the forward citations seems to be very strongly correlated with the stock market reaction, while um, uh, the patent quality, well, of course as well, but not as much. And I was wondering if, uh, um, let's say the outliers, uh, th there is some, uh, I don't know, some explanation for that, uh, some partner, uh, I mean, these are bin scatter plots. So these are not single, each observation is not a pattern. It's just a collection of patterns. Uh, if you have a thought about why they're, I mean. Are there more observations on the left going into the bins? So that could be reducing the noise. Uh, yeah, I mean, I did this at different points in time. So these are, but uh, no, I mean, it's the same. No, it's the same number of observations more or less. Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, they're all in the millions that go into the bin. So I don't, um, so I don't have a tremendously convincing answer about why this is happening. Are the uh, same? Here? It's just like, I'm always amazed if something looks like it has information in the data. So maybe I, it's, it's whether you're a half full or half empty type of person, I think. Are the citations measured over more than five years? Like the patent? Uh, yeah, they're actually measured over uh, the lifetime of the patent. So that could be it. That could be part of it. There are some, yeah, th there were some computational reasons because back when we did it, back in the ancient times of uh, 2015, we we're a lot more limited in computing power than we are now. Okay. So that okay. actually could be it because Thank this you. is uh, lifetime citations where this is measured over the next five years. Okay. okay. Thank you. So you can probably do this on your laptop now. Okay. Um, Okay, so here's a kind of a way to kind of summarize where we are. Um, I think that's a natural starting point. By no means, I think that's the end point. 
I think there's you can be creative and there's a lot of wealth of information out there. Then what can try to measure the degree to which firms innovate more broadly? Um, I mean, the first thing they're going to tackle, of course, is that how do you weigh these types of information more uh, differently? And in patents, for example, I think that's a first order issue. You want to try to take a stance of what exactly makes for a valuable patent and then make that adjustment. So I've seen people use information earnings calls to measure innovation. I think that's a fantastic idea. Uh, but I think you can be creative and uh, kind of think of other ways to get at the same idea, which is let me try to figure out a way to measure what's the rate of new inventions that accrue to either a specific firm or a specific sector in a particular point in time. Okay, I think that's a good place to pause for questions before we switch gears and talk about models. So let me pause for roughly 15 seconds to make sure we're all on the same page and then we can continue. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about models. So now we have some objects that we can use to test models that we write down. Let's see where we can go. So when we think about models, okay, so first, if this is a common source of risk, you need an aggregate shock, okay? So you know, a model, you, when you write down a model, this shock has to be systematic. And the way to think about this, it has to be something that correlates with the arrival of new technologies. So there are certain points in time through which there's more innovation happening overall than other points in time. Now, how do you model this? Well, you have a number of ways of doing that. The first way people thought about this was to write models where the productivity of capital depends on when it's created. Okay, so this goes back to Johansson or Solo. These guys wrote models in which the capital created at time S has a level of productivity that depends on the frontier technology at time S. Another way you could say is that, look, instead of modeling the productivity of capital, I can think of capital in terms of efficiency units. And what I can do is change the cost. So in models like this, and I think this goes back to uh, Solo, but also Greenwood, Herkowitz, and Crusell, the way people model this process is by declines in the price of capital goods. So think of this as what's happening over time is that the price of computing power is falling. So even though a laptop still costs $2,000 now, which is what cost back in 2000, those $2,000 buy you a lot more computing power than did back then. So then holding the quality of the capital good constant, if the price declines, that is another way of measuring technological progress. Okay, so people are referred to these things as investment specific shocks. Yet another way to do this would be to just say that there's a separate sector that produces capital goods and the productivity of that sector is XIT. So the sector that produces capital goods gets more productive, the relative price of capital goods will fall. So this has the same effect. Yet another way to do this we would just say that here's a model where there are expanding varieties. You have new products arriving and the arrival rate of new products is not constant over time, but it depends on some aggregate state variable XIT. And it turns out that these models versus models through which the set of products are fixed, but then they get continuously improving. They're actually not tremendously different. So you could write a model where there's a quality ladder, that it's a fixed set of products, but then these products improve. If the aggregate rate at which this thing happens changes over time, we'll basically lead you to the same conclusions. Okay, so all I'm saying is there's a wealth of ways of modeling this process. And for what I'm gonna discuss next, they're all gonna be more or less isomorphic. Okay, so here's an example of such a model. 
um, this is based on some earlier work I did with Leonid. So then what we did is we modeled the production process as taking place in a project. And by project, you can think of it as a single product, a single production stream, a location, however you want to call it. And what a firm is right now is a collection of different projects. Okay, so we're not going to model the firm as a whole, but we're going to model the project, and that's going to be important. Okay, what a project is, is basically a putty clay model through which when the project is created, you sink some capital in it, either physical or intangible. So when we, when we wrote it, we used the language for physical capital, but the same idea applies exactly to intangibles. So you sink some capital to it, and then there's some decreasing returns so that you know the, the you don't sink an infinite amount of capital. Equivalently, you could think of it as a shorthand for convex adjustment costs. And then once the project is created, uh, its productivity just follows some geometric barren motion. Think of it as an aggregate profitability shock, and there's some idiosyncratic productivity, which for our case it doesn't matter. Okay, so what's key here is that when the firm receives a new project, so these projects kind of fall from the skies that firms are moving around and then suddenly they get ideas for new projects. And what's key here is that they get to invest, but then the cost of investment depends on this new variable Xi T, which can tends to decline over time. So then one Xi T falls that sorry, when XIT goes up and it's which the price of new capital falls, now firms that get these new projects can create them at a larger scale. So we wrote we started but we're going to start by thinking of this in partial equilibrium. So I can think of the SDF as having some loading on the two aggregate shocks with some market price of risk. Let's say the interest rate is constant for now. And I can basically write down or solve explicitly for the value of the firm. That is, the firms are valuable for two reasons. First, they have claims on the cash flows from existing projects. And the value of that actually is psi t. It's proportional to psi t to the level of aggregate uh, profitability shocks, if you want, times some weighted average of their stock of existing projects weighted by the productivity. Interestingly enough, though, that's not the only source of value. Uh, firms also have claims of, on NPVs from future projects. These claims are valuable today. And the present value of those claims, which I'm going to call the present value of growth opportunities, is equal to this. Now, you can immediately see a wedge here, which is, at least in partial equilibrium, the value of existing projects does not depend on C whereas the value of future projects, the growth opportunities piece, does depend on the current value of Xi. And that has to do with the fact that Xi is persistent. So if Xi is high today, then it's going to be likely that it's going to be high tomorrow, which means that these future projects are going to be implemented at higher NPV. Okay, so what does this model give you? Uh, at the very least, you realize that these two pieces of firm value, assets in place and growth opportunities, are going to have very different exposures to this C shock. I rig the model so that they both have the same exposure to X. So X is just a level effect. But what C does is to change the relative value of these two objects, for growth opportunities and assets in place. Okay. Yeah, question on slide 33 um, before we move on. Yeah, go for it. Want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, the slide th 33, I, I guess it's the one before. So here in your production function, you have this uh, fully multiplicative specification, which basically two uh, random variables and the scale K. And I was wondering whether, so you have this effect of uh, investment specific shocks to the aggregate uh, productivity, which makes it related. So I was wondering whether you could do it like, for example, additive and separate them so that the uh, aggregate shock uh, does not have any impacts to the uh, um, project specific uh, shock. Is there any? Oh, you want me to separate to make this additive? 
Yes, like for example, kg to the alpha will be multiplied by xt plus say ujt. I mean, you can do that. Uh, I don't have a strong reason to a priori prefer one versus the other. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we write models typically where these things are additive in logs. Because uh, but here... if you have a strong economic reason to say that aggregate productivity, so aggregate, think of, so XT here is not a, I don't want to think of it as technology, think of it as everything else. Uh, it could be a demand shock. Let's think of it as a shock to aggregate demand. I think that's the simplest way to think about it. So uh, the question is whether shocks to aggregate demand and firm specific shocks to the quality of their product line are substitutes or complements. I think that's one way of phrasing yeah. your question. Exactly. And I don't have a strong, I mean, I would tend to think of them as complements. I haven't thought about them as substitutes, but I don't know, maybe I'm wrong and maybe there's a compelling reason why they should be. Okay. Uh, okay. But absent, yeah, I think, I mean, we can we can all write different functional forms for this, but I would, I would, I would like to think through a little bit more about why it makes sense for them to think to, for me to think of them as substitutes as opposed to complements. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dimitri is on the SDF on the next slide. Yep. Can you tell us how to think about gamma psi or, or that? Letter? I will. I, I will. Um, so right now, these are parameters because this is partial equilibrium. Yeah. Uh, in a little bit, I'm going to uh do a g version of this where they're going to come out out of preferences and assumptions of the structure of the model gotcha. um if you give me one slide i'm going to get there exact directly there because obviously the the sign the the magnitude and the sign of these things are going to matter yeah sure so um anyway so i i can solve for these two components of firm value then i can solve for the value of the firm which is a portfolio now of assets in place and growth opportunities and then I can calculate what the beta of the firm is with respect to these two shocks. So the way I set it up, I mean, I rigged it so that the beta with respect to the aggregate demand shock, if you want, is one. So all firms have the same exposure to that. But then the exposure of the firm now, which is again, it's a collection of assets in place and growth opportunities to this C shock is actually increasing in the fraction of firm value that it's due to growth opportunities. Okay, so you want to think of two extreme cases of this is one is the firm is just a startup, that is it has no existing assets, in which that case that ratio is close to one, that firm is going to be the primary beneficiary of any new changes in technology, any improvement in technology, if you have nothing currently, and the only value of the firm um, from a claim of few pro future projects. Okay, maybe not a startup is not the right analogy. Maybe something like a search fund or something. Something that basically you start with no assets, but you have some chance of finding new projects going forward. Well, that firm is going to have a very positive exposure to XE. This is going to be the firm that's going to primarily benefit from that. You can also go to the other extreme here, uh, which is a firm that has no growth opportunities. And in partial equilibrium, what's going to happen is that firm is, just won't benefit much from this improvement in C. So given these two betas, I can write down uh, explicitly what is the uh, risk premium associated with that firm. And it's a weighted average of uh, you know, bet, the risk exposures times prices of risk. So it makes sense to think of gamma x is positive so if x goes up everyone everything gets more profitable so that price of risk should be positive now let's think about the second part right there what it basically says is that the risk premium of the firm is going to be a function of its asset composition and that relation is going to depend on the sign of gamma okay so there are actually two things that you learn from here one is that this ratio of PVGO to V, to the extent that it's correlated with certain firm characteristics, it should predict returns. And then two, 
there's going to be excess movement here because these firms that are sorted on some characteristics that correlate with that object are going to have excess movement because they're exposed to the same technology shocks. Let's see, so you get both a statement about average returns being different, but also you get a statement about co movement of these firms with different characteristics. So if you think, for example, that a firm's market to book ratio, and again, we can talk about how exactly we should calculate market to book, is going to be higher if the firm has more growth opportunities relative to assets in place. And again, I'm assuming that you know this is an ideal world, you can actually include the value of intangibles to the book assets. Then we'd expect these firms to move together with other firms that have high market to book ratio. Why? Because they're exposed to the same shocks. Okay. There, one second. Should, shouldn't there be, you could allow also for individual firms' own growth opportunities to have a different beta to the aggregate shock? Um, yeah, you could do that. Is before you showed how, whatever, there was like a patent and like the competitor firms all went down. Um, so that was obviously an idiosyncratic case, but you could imagine even respect to the aggregate shocks that actually some firms are just being displaced by it. And, and, and be made worse off. You can make the model richer for sure. Um, you can include, I think what you're asking for is you're asking for some competition in the search for new ideas. Yeah. Uh, it's absolutely possible. You can, you can definitely enrich this. I mean, we, this is, a, you know, this was the simplest structure we could think of that drives that point. But I think you can, one, one can think of, of other ways of enriching this. Um, and maybe one way of doing it is to start by modeling a small industry where firms compete, and there are actually already models of that, um, and then think about how the risk changes. That's right. Um, okay, so what you get out of the structure now is you get a few things. Mechanically, you get the failure of the CAPM simply because the market portfolio now is a particular combination of assets in place and growth opportunities, the way I wrote it, there's no deep reason why it should work. Uh, and more importantly, for our purposes, you get uh, this residual movement, which is even if you hedge out, quote, the market, which is a one particular combination of X and C, you're still going to get residual movement simply because you won't get the weights right. Now, this brings us to the discussion of the price of risk. Now, for this to work in the data and by work, I put in quotation marks, I mean, to generate a pattern through which growth opportunities have a lower risk premium than assets in place, uh, you need a negative uh, price, you need this gamma C to be negative. Now, why do, why do I call this to work? Well, remember my motivation earlier on where I said there are all these characteristics that seem to be correlated with firms having more growth opportunities they're associated with lower returns going forward. Well, that pattern can be rationalized in this world, but then you need this gamma C to be negative. Okay, what does that mean? Let's be very clear. It means that the STF has to rise when C increases, which strikes many people as counterintuitive. I mean, you think that in a world where we all have better phones, technology has improved, that has to be, quote, good news for the representative household, they get to consume more, and that's the world in which um, margin utility should be low, therefore the SDF should fall. And the answer is maybe, or maybe not. The first thing to realize is even in that model that you have in mind, it's not entirely obvious that consumption is gonna rise on impact. And the reason for that is that in general, if you take this structure and you put it in general equilibrium, the only way that C is going to increase consumption if it's actually implemented in new investment. So on impact, actually, what you'll see is that consumption will fall. And another way to say this is that the marginal value of a dollar is going to be high when investment opportunities are high. So people in corporate finance have this insight, which is why do firms hedge? And what firms want to do is they want to have more money in states of the world where their investment opportunities are good. That is, if you're financially constrained, you can not raise capital for a new project. What you want to do is you want to transfer resources to states of the world in which investment opportunities are good. So from their perspective, they view this as being high state price 
uh, they want to hedge into those states. So whether this is intuitive or not, I think that's there's some debate. Okay, we can write models through which one thing happens and then one is, which is another thing happens. But the also thing to emphasize is that much of this intuition that you that you might have is um, follows from models through which there's a representative household. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to discuss reasons why that uh, that may not necessarily be the right way of doing that. So I think that's a good place to take a break. So okay. let's break for 10 minutes and then uh, reconnect uh, at uh, 9.15. 10.15 on the East Coast. Great. See you guys. So, um, all right, so having uh, had a view now what the partial equilibrium model delivers, now let's think about more broadly what would happen in GE. And that's a useful exercise for at least two reasons. So the first thing is there are, the partial equilibrium model kind of understates this phenomenon because assets in place, as you said, are basically unaffected by technology that doesn't have this idea of a replacement effect. Um, instead, what you might happen in reality, when, when these new types of capital become more productive due to competition, because firms are all competing in the same market, uh, the value of assets in place will fall. So G is going to give you that. And the second thing that G, G will give you is it's actually going to endogenize the price of risk for C. Now, what happens in G is in a world with complete markets, that is, there's a representative household uh, that basically consumes whatever is being produced in the economy, then the sign of the price of risk depends on preferences. So if a household has CRA preferences or the EIS is lower than the reciprocal of risk aversion, then what's going to happen in that model is the SDF will rise. If on the other hand, the, the EIS is sufficiently high higher than the reciprocal or risk aversion, then households are going to view the rise in future consumption as more than enough to compensate for the fact that consumption falls today. And in that model, the margin will actually fall. OK, but to be clear, this is a world in which markets are complete. Um, and C has no redistributional effects whatsoever. Now we can contrast it in a case where markets are incomplete um, in that the rents or the benefits from C don't accrue equally to everyone, but some say Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk get much more of it than me. Uh, I think that's, that's a world in which probably is somewhat more realistic. And in that world, there's a number of interesting things that are happening. Specifically, you can actually have the stochastic discount factor to rise. And now, of course, you can ask what exactly, what is the stochastic discount factor in a model with incomplete markets? Well, think of it as the part of everyone's margin utility uh, that's common. You can actually get that to rise. And it turns out you don't need a lot of it. You don't need a lot of ingredients there. Uh, you just need basically for a small part of the population to directly benefit from these projects. And then if people have some FOMO, uh, then they get upset that other people got rich. OK, so I'm going to discuss a little bit. Of, I'm going to discuss it in the context of uh, the paper of the JP with uh, Leonid and Noah, because it's going to build the yeah. same structure. Dimitris, is it um, like enough kind of intuitively to have investment has to go up when when the size shock hits, right? So consumption goes down. That's always going to go up. So on impact, what happens is investment will go up, consumption will go down. So in a CRA world, 
the SDF rises. Now, so you, uh, in, what happens in that model is that consumption T plus one will go up because now you have more capital. Sure. So then depending on how you think, you know, if you have some type of recursive utility, like they say, F sin zing, depending on how you think that about that, you can get the, the margin utility of the representative versus to either rise or fall. Right. Okay, so it's not just a function of current consumption. I mean, no, it's, because it's, it's, you know, it's, it depends what enters your margin utility. So in a world where um, preferences are time separable, another way to say this, the EAS is equal to the reciprocal of risk conversion, then the SDF will rise. In a world where these two things are separate, it depends on the difference between the EAS and the risk conversion. And what happens in that model is if the EIS is very low, the fact that consumption falls right now Hurts makes more. household want to move resources into that, stare, into that state because they're very upset about the fact that now their consumption profile is deeply upward sloping. Whereas if the AS is sufficiently high, they don't care about it so much and then just view the future with more optimism if you want, the future looks better, in which case margin until the falls. That's my metaphor for, that's at least my understanding of what's happening in that type of model. And what did you exactly mean by FOMO? You kind of mentioned it in passing, but that's- I'm gonna talk a little bit about, I'm gonna have the household have preferences, not just over its own consumption. I'm gonna also gonna allow it to benchmark its utility relative to what everyone else is doing. Like a habit. The, uh, but a, yeah, a habit, but not a linear habit. So your preferences are going to be your you're going to consume your 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 consumption basket is going to be something like this. So this won't change the coefficient of relative risk conversion because everything is proportional, mm -hmm. but it will make you care about what happens to your own consumption relative to what everyone else is doing. Now. One way to think about microfounding this is we're all kind of competing for some local resources that are scarce, real estate, land, et cetera. So Alexi, if you know suddenly everyone in Wall Street gets a massive bonus and you're renting, um, that's or you're competing for schools or whatever it is you're competing that's scarce, that's gonna make you uh, effectively consume less. That's right. Okay. Okay. So the model is going to have a similar structure as before. Uh, there's going to be these projects that produce output. Uh, I'm going to follow the the formulation through which it's like the original solo formulation, which if the project is created at some point tau, it's going to inherit the productivity that's state of the art at that point in time. Okay, that's my innovation shock. The rest is relatively the same, more or less. There are these sort of aggregate demand shocks that you know move stuff around, and the level of frontier technology is going to move around again. Um, so that's that's basically the model. It's basically as before. Uh, and then a, a question in the chat. I think I missed it before. Oh, go for it, Matthew. You want to ask your question? Um, Sure. Just while you both were talking about the uh, stochastic discount factor, I was just is is one way to interpret that that uh, the arrival of some new innovation um, makes it so that now okay, well now I'll save uh, a little bit more because uh, the future consumption is going to be so much better. Uh, it's not no. Uh, you don't want to save because of that. Is actually if you don't invest more, output doesn't increase. So it's the because in these models, the, than the, in, okay. the, in these okay. models, the only way C affects output if it's actually implemented into new capital. So this would be so. So, uh, so there might be some difference. So this will between... always happen. So this will always happen, and this will always happen because these new investments are going to bear fruit at some point down the line. So, uh, so this will be different than from a model where maybe you have, uh, uh, you know, two goods, two consumption goods, and uh, you can consume one now, but then another one has to be sort of unlocked by some sort of innovation shock. That's okay. No, that, that, that's going to be the same. Uh, as long as that unlocking doesn't happen for free, mm -hmm. but you have to give up some resources today. 
Okay. So if it yeah. comes from if it comes if it happens for free, then there's no aggregate resources being spent. Then it's just the endowment shock, right? It's just we're sitting around and now suddenly there's more stuff. But if you have to give up some resources today for that to happen, then mechanically your consumption is going to be lower today. But then you're going to have more stuff later on. So that fits into pretty much the same framework. So I think this idea is more general. Makes sense. It's just what you call consumption now is some composite of these two goods. Um, now you can say maybe the weights change or something. I mean, you, you can probably, you can definitely make what you said richer than this. Um, but I think on some level, you're trading off having fewer stuff now in exchange for more stuff later. So I think that's a, that's a robust feature of the model. What's not robust is how you feel about it. Is that what's your, how would your marginal utility respond in this state of the world? That I think we can debate a little bit and say, well, it kind of depends. Do you value a dollar more when investment opportunities are good or less? Yeah, I mean, if there were a cancer drug, for instance, that's going to allow me to live 20 years longer, you know, yeah, right. my, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that, that's that, right? But keep in mind, though, that this, what we just said, is a model through which these benefits of these new goods kind of accrue equally to everyone. So I think the cancer drug is a great example, which is, okay, maybe the firm that patents the cancer drug gets very rich, but there are these indirect spillovers for me, which now I don't need to worry about getting cancer. I mean, I, maybe I'll go bankrupt, but you know, still I'll, I'll live. And therefore I'll save more because I'll, I'll live longer perhaps, or- No, no, this is like not that. what's happening. So this is what happens at the aggregate level. So if we have to create, spend resources to get the cancer drug going, then we're going to have to, right now we don't have any, anything to show for it. We're just giving up resources. Uh, I think that's what you mean by saving more, right? It's just, we're, we're investing more. There's no saving in this model simply because the, the risk-free asset is in, in zero net supply, right? For every saver, there's a borrower. I mean, what is happening, the economy as a whole, if you want, is saving more by investing more, but they're really investing more to make these things uh, a reality, so to speak. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I think it makes sense. I think I think what what, what I'm uh, uh, no, I'll, I'll I'll think through it more. But uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's just the right language. I think to think in this world. I mean, you can think of it saving, but it's really that you're investing to make the cancer drug happen. Because if you don't invest, then there's no cancer drug. Yeah, it's just I an idea I, for a cancer drug. I think I understand the distinction you're drawing there, and and why it's important. Um, okay. Yeah, that and that's the that, that's the that's the key part of the that these makes these shocks different, which is if you don't do anything about it, you don't actually get anything for it. So it's not mana that comes from the sky as free, is you have to kind of give up something now in exchange for more stuff later. So another way of what these another way to think about what these types of technology shocks do is that change the rate of return of investment, that change the marginal return to investing a dollar now versus later. In the language of Q theory, what's moving around is marginal Q. Okay, so anyway, the model has a similar structure as before with some more details. The details are not super important for now. What I want you guys to think about is the fact that this C shock is changing the profitability slash productivity of only new projects, not the existing projects. Okay, and then there's you know there's a few more bells and whistles. So the key part here is that a large fraction of these benefits are going to accrue to the Elon Musk's of the world, not me. Uh, so the way the model works is that in principle anyone can have an idea for a new project, and once you have an idea for a new project, is what you do is you sell the blueprint to an existing firm which implements the project and you get a share ETA. And the model is not rich enough to have real firms. So if you want is you create a startup and then your startup gets acquired or if it doesn't get acquired, it doesn't really matter. The whole point here is that an innovator gets to appropriate some fraction of the value of her idea. 
the remainder goes to the firm that implements that project. So shareholders actually get something, but they don't get the full amount. Okay, so because people get rich in this model, in order to keep the distribution stationary, they also have to you need to have some type of OLG structure. And, and then the other thing that households do is they work. And labor in this model is super boring. There's nothing interesting happening with labor. We just sit around and we supply labor. And later on, we're going to think about whether that makes sense or not. But for now, this is what's happening. Um, now, this model is actually very tractable, that even though it's rich, um, it actually, it's not significantly harder to solve than a model with a representative agent. And the trick to doing so is that the cross-sectional distribution of firms and household wealth, even though they're not constant, they constantly evolve and respond to the shocks, they actually don't matter for equilibrium prices. So you don't need to keep track of distributions as a state variable. It's just enough to keep track of aggregate objects. Okay, now we can talk about what the SDF is. So the SDF is just a projection of the individual SDFs on the space of traded assets. Think of it as a common component of everyone's margin utility. And what's going to be key here is that a, a, a key object in that SDF, rather, a key object in margin utility um, is going to be uh, look at the household's value function. It's going to depend on their wealth share. So I'm going to consume something that's proportional to my wealth. So my share of the consumption of the aggregate uh, economy is going to be proportional to my wealth. So keeping in mind that these are going to be dynamics that are going to be uh, they're going to play a big role. Uh, so the model has quote long run risk in the sense that there's a permanent and transitory decomposition of uh, aggregate consumption and output. Uh, so there's a there's a stochastic trend, and then the economy fluctuates around that trend uh, because of uh, decreasing returns to investment eventually. So you know when, once the way the, the the model works is that when C improves, new projects become more profitable, and then we slowly kind of accumulate capital stock to reach that state, and then as C improves again, we're going to go there. Anyway, anyway th that's that's less interesting for what I'm going to say. So this is how um, these are the impulse responses of some quantities in the model to uh, improvement in C. So a shock to C translates into higher output in the long run, not right now. So on impact, nothing happens. But over time, as the, accum the economy accumulates better projects, output rises. What's the process through which this happens? Well, you invest more. So you have to increase investment. And because on impact, Output doesn't change, whereas investment rises, then aggregate consumption has to fall. Okay, so in a model with a representative agent and Sierra utility, that alone would lead to a rise in SCF. But of course, because consumption is higher going forward, depending on how you think about the future versus the present, that is how you think about the risk aversion versus AES, the sign of the, the price of risk can basically be either positive or negative. Uh, if you look at aggregate dividends in the economy, uh, they fall. And the reason for that is that firms are cutting dividends to invest more. Because for, for the whole economy, investment opportunities got better. So then firms are going to pay out less and then uh, invest more. And here, to be clear, this is not really dividends. This is um, basically uh, the difference between profits and investment. So there's no, this is not a model where there's a clear dividend policy. This is what firms could pay out if they wanted to. So think of this as free cash flows to equity, as opposed to, uh, well, these are really free cash flows, not uh, dividends, but you know, so that distinction is sub subtle, but it's also important to keep that in mind that these models actually don't have any predictions about dividends unless you make an assumption about dividend policy. Okay, so the value of labor income rises. So labor here is a perfect, uh, can work perfectly with any technology. So then all the workers are happy and the SDF rises. Okay, so now this may seem a little bit surprising because you know consumption looks better going forward. And by the way, I've calibrated the model so that risk aversion is very high relative to EIS. 
So this is sort of the quote standard calibration in literature. Um, so then it's surprising then that the AS, the SDF rises even though the future looks better. And let's try to understand a little bit what's happening here. So the first thing to realize is that individuals don't all consume the same amount because they have different wealth. So an individual's consumption, I can write it as some share of aggregate consumption. And what's important is the dynamics of this wealth share. So the first thing to realize is that what's happening here is there's a little bit of a duffy Constantinidis effect going on. That if I think, look at the dynamics of an individual household's wealth share, there's something that depends on DT, which doesn't matter for us. But then once the household gets an idea, she's gonna appropriate a fraction of that idea, ETA. And depending on how valuable that idea is, that ratio, which is a state variable in this economy, her wealth will jump, her wealth shares will jump as well. So basically think of this as in this model, households have this idiosyncratic risk to their consumption because they're getting these new ideas. And the, this idiosyncratic risk, the size of that depends on the relative value of new projects relative to total wealth. Okay, so another way to think of this is that the volatility of consumption growth varies over time because this innovation lottery essentially reallocates wealth shares from existing households to the Elon Musk's of the world. And the size of that distribution the size of that redistributive effect depends on the rate of innovation in the economy. If there's no innovation, then these new projects are not very valuable. There's very little redistribution happening versus there's a lot of redistribution. Now this volatility of consumption growth becomes more important. Okay, so then it's useful to keep then track of what's happening in the cross section of households. And here it's useful to draw the distinction between the average household and the median household, because this illustrates what's happening, which is when the shock hits, nothing happens to the average. The average wealth share is gonna be the same, it's one, because the households are normalized to measure one, but then the median falls. So what this is telling you is that, uh, sorry, the labels are missing for these figures. This is the wealth share. Um, so what this is telling you is that now the distribution of wealth in the economy became a lot more right skewed. That the Elon Musk of the world and Jeff Bezos of the world now own a larger fraction of the economy as before. So everything became more right skewed. This is individual consumption. So individual consumption still goes up, but the median goes up by much less than the average, which is another statement of saying that the distribution of consumption growth now became a lot more right skewed. That Elon Musk's consumption went up significantly more than mine. What this is, is um, what happens if I also take into account the fact that you have relative preferences. And then now you're seeing that for most of the households, in fact, their consumption basket, which now includes the fact that not only I consume my own good, but I'm also worried about my relative consumption relative to the average, that goes down. And yet another way to say the same thing is that the volatility of my STF has gone up which is a statement of the what I said before. Uh, Dimitri, so, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, go for it. Uh, one question was whether, back to the firms, I guess, whether you're assuming it's all equity finance. The yeah, it's all, I mean, or it could there's be no debt in the model. So it's, I'm all doing it from the perspective of firms. So there's no financial friction. There's no financial friction whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, Dimitri, I have a yeah. The good question is, um, just like I mean, in the productive based model, this is a standard assumption, right? It's the 
dividend equals the revenue minus investments. But think about right, your model when there is a positive ST shock, right? The dividend actually decreases. But that is the time, right? That is the bad time. So I'm just thinking, right? If you allow for the like uh, bond financing, right? I don't know how exactly the cost of the bond. But that's where help right the firm to smooth their dividend, so make firm more valuable. So it seems like if adding right the bond finance will change, maybe change the, the results. Yeah, I mean, maybe it, it depends what you assume. I mean, I guess I mean one has. I mean, obviously you're going to assume many things. Um, I think just adding debt mechanically, this will just amplify the volatility of equity. So if I have to make pay, if I, let's say all firms have a console bond and they have to make interest payments, then that's a part of output that they need to do. Now, what happens if they can adjust the capital structure in anticipation of that? I think, or they need to refinance or that. I mean, these are all interesting questions that I don't know the answer right. to. I think that's worth doing for sure. Right, and my, my thing is just like uh, raise the price for the dividend cash flow and the price raise for the risk rates is uh, it could be very different. Absolutely, no, it could be very, very different. I right. think that's an interesting thing to right. explore. I don't have a, uh, okay, I don't yeah. have a priority <laughs> so view. Nobody have, what yeah, nobody have done that. Yeah, I just okay. As this far as I know, no, I don't. I don't think anyone has. Right. Thank um, you. Dimitris, do you have intuition here why the shock to the SDF is so permanent? Everything else is kind of, you know, the, even the the displacement shock um, on the next. I mean, in these models, the so, the okay. So, if the shock to the SDF were not permanent, then it would have to be the case that uh, I mean, it's not super permanent because the risk free rate is moving around, but risk premium in these models are in this model is pretty much constant. Mm -hmm. So why would the SDF have a transitory component? Is because the the risk premium changes, so it changes the rate at which the SDF uh, reverts back. So does it like the volatility of the SDF comes back down? It comes back down, but then yeah. the drift doesn't. The drift mm -hmm. is more or less constant. And what's the drift? The drift is basically the risk free rate. Yeah. So the risk this there's some action in that risk free rate, but not not that much. Mm -hmm. Um. So then you can think about what does that model imply for long-term bond prices relative to equity. So there's an old paper by um, uh, Alvarez and Yerman sure. that make the point that uh, for the mo for these types of for models to rationalize an equity premium of stocks over long-term bonds, you need a large permanent component, and that's sort of what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason for this is that just the risk rate doesn't move around very much. But that's a feature of the calibration too. If you could, just because in the data, at least the, the, the movements in the risk rate, at least at higher frequencies are not that big. I mean, you'd think the increase in the idiosyncratic risk that would, would make the risk free rate go down, but not. Yes, there's, there's some of that happening. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's an offsetting effect, which now we're all richer. The growth rate, yeah. Uh, I think both of these elements combine to make the risk rate more stable. Um, again, the model is sort of calibrated to fit the low volatility of risk rate, so that's sort of mechanical. Now, is that a deep feature of the model? No, I'm sure a different calibration could produce a very volatile risk rate. But that's 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 what's happening here. Got it. Um, so, based on that, you can understand now why for most people in this economy, this doesn't look like an amazing uh, shock going forward. I mean, I still may end up being feeling happier, uh, but I'm a little bit upset about the fact that I'm definitely not consuming as much as Elon Musk. So that's that's kind of what's happening here. That's why I said you needed, uh, there are two key ingredients here. One was in complete markets, so that not everyone gets the same share of rents from new innovations. But also, you need a little bit of FOMO so that I'm always, always benchmark, benchmarking my uh, utility relative, my, my individual consumption relative to the aggregate. And I think there's this is not a crazy description of the world. I mean, there are all these surveys where you know, people have these self-reported measures of happiness. And even though the world has grown tremendously richer over the last 50 years, it's not that people report being 
uh, significantly happier as a result. And again, I don't, I, I don't think I have anything deep to say here. It's just that this is a feature of the model that helps you get there. Um, this is what happens to individual firms. Uh, and I've plotted two types of firms here. One is a growth firm in solid lines. Um, and the other one is a, a value firm in the dotted lines. And what's a growth firm and a value firm in the model is a growth firm is one in which it has uh, very little existing projects, but it's likely to receive a lot of projects going forward. Uh, and a value firm is the opposite. A value firm is a big firm that has a lot of existing projects, but very few growth opportunities going forward. So for growth firms, uh, C shock is great news. Uh, it means higher profits going forward. They invest more. They cut dividends to invest. Uh, but because they're going to get more dividends going forward, their, their market values go up. Whereas for value firms is less good news because uh, they're being displaced because they're competing the same market as these other firms. Uh, so their dividends decline, but more importantly, their market values decline. Okay, so we calibrate the model to try to fit sort of the standard uh, asset pricing targets. So the model has a you know reasonably smooth consumption, both in the short run, but also in the long run. We try to match the volatility of the share of shareholders. So there are also shareholders. The model I didn't talk about this. It helps um, match quantitatively a few things. Uh, there's a sizable equity premium. The risk rate is low and stable. And then the model generates a value factor, not just a value premium, but also it generates uh, the failure of the CAPM to price the value factor. Okay, so actually the model is a little bit too well relative to the data. Um, so you could probably scale things down a little bit. Okay, so I think I, I, I walked you through the intuition of what that's happening. Uh, now, is there some evidence, additional evidence you can use to calibrate some of these facts? Um, we also used uh, this direct measure of innovation that I talked about earlier, which is based on this value of patents, and look at what happens to cash flows of firms when other firms in the same industry innovate. And what you see is that for value firms, these are firms that have um, low valuation ratios. In both the model and the data, uh, their cash flows decline going forward. Whereas for growth firms, again, this is again what happens to other firms in the same industry, they have a much smaller response. Okay, so this is an example of how you can use some direct measure of innovation in the data, and then you can construct a direct model equivalent because what was the value of, of, of these proj of these patents? Well, I could construct the value of a single idea in the model and then try to uh, be a little bit more disciplined about how I map the data to the model. Anyway, so basically what's happening in the model is that these growth firms are less likely to be displaced simply because they keep innovating. Um, and as a result, because they're less likely to be displaced in a state of the world where the SDF is high, uh, they have a lower discount rate. So that's basically the how does the model work. Okay, so quantitatively, uh, if it's the data uh, at a cost of uh, potentially uh, extreme parameters. So what's happening in the model is that uh, households are pretty risk averse. So the coefficient of relative risk aversion is 40. Uh, which I'm told is too high. Uh, the other thing that's happening is that households put most of their weight in the relative consumption. So these are relatively extreme parameters. Uh, and then you can want to think about what, what exactly is the model capturing and what's not capturing. Okay, so let me pause here for 15 seconds for questions and then I'm going to continue. Okay, so if you think about it for more than 10 seconds and you realize that what's missing from the model is many important channels. And the fact that labor in the model is a great hedge for technology. You can about the way workers feel like in the model is because their labor, 
works with any technology vintage, these guys are happy. And because for most households, labor income is their largest source of wealth, this gives households a built-in hedge against technological progress, against technological innovation. So even though their value of their value portfolio goes down, the value of their labor income goes up. So now they have this amazing hedge. Now that's kind of an extreme assumption. Like it basically assumes that there's no labor, labor market frictions whatsoever. That is workers can frictionally move across firms. Uh, it also assumes that their labor income is fully diversifiable because what happens in the model is that workers sell claims to their future labor income. So they take no individual risk whatsoever. Uh, the model also assumes there's no skill displacement. That is, anyone can work with any capital without any loss in productivity. And there's also no automation in the model. Like this, there's the, there's no type of technology, there's no type of capital that directly displaces labor. Okay, so you can these are all the absence of all these channels is going to, as you can see, mute this effect. Okay, because from the perspective of an individual household. You have this built-in hedge, your labor income, which seems to be amazing, uh, does very well when technology improves. So maybe you want to think a little bit about that. Now, it's always easy to add things in models, right? So we could write down a model through many of these channels. But before we do that, it's also helpful to first look at data and see whether this can help us um, guide the models in a particular direction. So. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to talk, go back to measurement, and then we're going to go back to models. Dimitris, real yes. quick, can you say something about other asset pricing factors? Like, you know, value is one thing, but what about, you know, uh, there's an investment factor. Right. So um, all these things, to the extent that there, there are these characteristics that I mentioned earlier. So the extent to you think these are correlated with quote, the growthiness of the firm, that is the share of firm value that's correlated with growth opportunities, they're going to replicate the same facts. But doesn't the, the model, model, yeah, what is the model tell us? Yeah. So in the model, the, the state variable at the firm that predicts returns is that ratio. To the extent that you think these firms are investing more, then it's going to have the same pattern as a growth firm. To the extent that these firms have low cash flows, they're not very profitable, these firms are also going to have low returns. To the extent that you think these firms have more idiosyncratic volatility, it's going to have the same pattern. Yeah, I think it's that second one that I'm not sure holds in the data that they tend to be more profitable usually, don't they? Which ones? The, the high market to book kind of. Well, but I think that's a function of how you measure. You're, we're missing a lot of intangibles in book value. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Apple, for example, this looks like a very profitable firm, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't call Apple as a value uh, as a growth firm. Like in model world, I would classify Apple as having a lot of assets in place mm -hmm. and some growth opportunities. Okay, we have good. And that's going to be missed by, by market to book, simply because the book value of Apple. If you look at the book value of equity for Apple, is sixty billion dollars. Whereas the market value of equity for Apple is three trillion, right. and that's because the only thing that shows up in Apple's balance sheet in terms of assets is uh, some real estate and some inventories and some cash. Is most of the intangibles don't show up in book values. You want the intangibles, but not the growth opportunities. Exactly. You want to you want you want to think about the what do I think of assets, intangibles as assets in place? Were the iPhone? Uh, most of like over fifty percent of Apple's revenues come from the iPhone, so I think I want to I want this as an asset. These are assets in place. What are the growth opportunities? I don't know the Apple Car. Okay. I would argue that most of uh, Apple's market value right now probably comes from assets in place, not growth opportunities. Even though as you calculate its market to book, it's probably extremely high. Okay. Okay. Any so questions, anyone? I guess it's a natural stopping point, right? 
yeah, that's a natural starting point in case any people have questions before we start talking about uh, labor income. It might actually be a good time to take a break too, no? Because sure. we're back in the hour. So let's break for uh, 10 minutes until 10.05. Sounds good. 11.05 Eastern. You might want to pause the video too. That's why I think that that's a feature of the model that's going to be hard to match. Anyway, going back to uh, this discussion on labor income, um, let's think through about how workers, uh, how their cash flows, their labor income would respond to technological progress. And in the model that we wrote down so far, basically the only uh, agents that take a hit, or everyone takes a hit, but it only happens through their financial wealth. Um, and that happens because uh, all the workers are equally productive with any technology, so then there's no displacement of human capital, and they can move wherever they want, uh, and that's because they all receive the same wage. Now, that's probably not how the world works, um, and I thought about it two ways, that this is clearly unrealistic, the first one is um, there might be reasons why a worker might get displaced directly uh, by new technology, either because that technology is doing things that I'm doing and doesn't need me, so it's a labor-saving technology, or it's a technology I could use, but I'm just not as good at using it as I was using the old technology. For a given example, uh, MATLAB you know, is very good at coding in MATLAB, but now everyone's switching to Python, I definitely can figure out how to do that. So that means my human capital is less valuable than it was before. Um, so that's one channel. And this is um, the way this works is by directly affecting the productivity of a worker in a specific task. A more indirect channel can happen even if the, pro the worker's productivity remains unaffected. If there's some friction, that leads the worker to appropriate a share of a surplus from being in that firm, say in a model where there's search frictions and um, me and the firm are a very good match. So I get some surplus from that. Um, if there's something that causes either that match to dissolve because let's say the firm lost a product line to another firm or because um, the surplus gets distributed differently, um, I may get uh, a hit in terms of my wages, even though my productivity got unaffected directly. So I'm gonna talk about both of these channels next, um, but what follows is primarily gonna be an empirical exercise. I mean, it's gonna have some models, but it's, the first step I think is to look for these things in the data, and then we can think about how do we add them into models. Okay, so let's talk about the first channel, that is the direct displacement of workers. Um, and I think there are two ways a worker can get displaced. Uh, the first one is I'm doing something, let's say I'm booking uh, tickets for travel, and now there's a new technology that allows anyone to book these tickets without me, um, that automates uh, my task, so that directly affects me. And the second thing is if that new technology, I need to acquire some new skills in order to be as effective as using it, um, so you might think that's going to displace at least the incumbent workers, at least in the beginning, while they're still figuring out how to do it. Now, one question you could ask is, would this necessarily matter for asset pricing? So you could say no. Uh, one answer is no, if you think that these are effects that only matter for workers that don't earn a lot of money. Think of them as low-skill or low-income workers. And if you think these guys don't participate in the stock market, then your prior might be that these channels may matter for things like inequality, but they will not matter for uh, asset returns at all. Perhaps, or perhaps not. Um, I think the question is gonna be what's happening in the data. So I think that's a, that's a useful place to start. Now, the first challenge of course is, okay, that's easier said than done. How exactly can I measure, uh, create a measure of how exposed specific workers are to a particular technology? 
So now we're going to back to patents. Um, and this is based on uh, new work with Larry, uh, Larry, uh, Leonid, Larry, and uh, Brian. Uh, so what we're going to do there is we're going to try to connect specific technologies, and we're going to focus on breakthrough patents to specific workers, and by that I mean specific occupations, based on how similar uh, the description between the innovation and the tasks that workers perform. Now, you can say, well, what, what does this measure? Well, you can measure a few things. Um, one thing that could measure is if you have a technology that looks a lot similar to what the task that the worker does, you could say, well, maybe what that technology does is replace the worker at performing this task. It would be an example of a labor-saving technology. Or you could say, well, it's a complement because it helps workers perform this task more efficiently, even though you might think that maybe this requires some retraining or requires these workers to acquire new skills. Okay, so here's an example of what you can get. This is from ONET. Um, it's a description of the tasks that economists do. So a lot of the stuff that we do is to study economic and statistical data in an area of specialization, such as finance, labor, agriculture, good luck research, supervised research projects, et cetera. Okay, so this is a block of text that you can get from ONET. And then what we did is we took the description of the patent, the whole patent document, we took the block of text from ONET, and then we created a distance measure between the two. Okay, and then there's some, you know, wrinkles how exactly you do this because words could have a similar meaning even though they look different. So we used word embeddings to do this. The details are unimportant. What matters for now is that I have a distance measure between a particular patent and a specific occupation. So then what we did is we created an index of technology exposure for worker I, well, I now index is a specific worker, and this could happen at the level of an occupation or an industry or an occupation, as an accumulated, as a sum of all the important patents based on how far they are from that description of tasks that the worker performs. Okay, so basically what it does is it's going to vary across time as new innovations arrive, but it's also going to vary across workers because not everyone is exposed to the same technology in the same degree. Okay, so the first thing to note is that this construction, this object, um, which is now at the level of an occupation and a point in time, is correlated with subsequent employment in that occupation. And you can also do the same thing at the industry occupation level. And interestingly enough, the coefficient is negative. So what this is saying is that occupations that experienced, uh, that are very close to technological breakthroughs that happen at that point in time, subsequently experience employment declines. Okay, so this looks a lot like a labor displacing shock, which is employment in these occupations falls. Now to this, you can say, well, maybe that's not surprising. Maybe what's happening is that you're directing more technologies um, to occupations where there's scarcity in labor. That is, you know, we need a lot of workers, there's just not enough of them. So we're gonna to try to uh, innovate more in these areas. Well, maybe, but if you look at wage growth, actually you see the opposite effect. So if there's a lot of uh, exposed, if what particular ex occupation is particularly exposed to technology at a point in time, that occupation experiences not only uh, declines in employment, but also de experiences decline in average wages. So that's probably, so whatever is driving this is probably not scarcity. Now, you can say, are we done now? Well, not exactly, because average wages in an occupation doesn't tell me a lot of things about the wage of a worker in that occupation. If there's exit at the bottom or at the top, this can skew the average in a particular way. So what I wanna do now is I wanna see what happens to individual workers as opposed to average workers in a particular occupation. 
Um, so in terms of stylized facts, one thing that you might want to know is that um, workers at the middle of the incoming distribution tend to be more exposed. So this is consistent with the view of uh, job polarization, which is the, the sort of middle income distribution. The middle income uh, occupations are being uh, are more exposed to technology rather than occupations at either the bottom or the top. Um, another thing that comes out here is how these, which occupations are more exposed have shifted over time. So for much of the sample up until the 1950s or so, the occupations that were mostly exposed to technology were effectively manual uh, skill occupations. These are effectively blue collar, blue collar workers. But the interesting thing that's happening since the arrival of the ICT is that now you have increased exposure of occupations that would be classified as routine cognitive tasks. Effectively, you want to think of them as more white collars are being exposed to technology. Um, and similarly, uh, if you were to cut these things by education, more, the workers that were mostly exposed to technology were workers without a college degree. Um, but again, that pattern is changing uh, over the last few decades since the arrival of ICT. Okay, so with these trends in mind, let's go back and try to understand what's happening to a specific worker. Um, so I have uh, administrative data, tax data for a sample of individuals that are linked to the CPS. This allows me to figure out what is a worker's occupation. So then I can pick Alexi. Uh, who I know is a finance professor now. There's a lot of innovation happening that finance professors are exposed to. Let's see what's happening to Alexis earnings over the next five years. So what you're seeing here is that workers in affected occupations experience roughly a two to 3% decline in wage earnings uh, over the next three to 10 years. Okay, so first that's a permanent decline. Uh, these earnings never recover. And then two, uh, this includes a number of uh, fixed effects interacted by occupation and industry. So these coefficients are identified by comparing two workers in the same occupation in different industries or two workers in the same industry at different occupations. Okay, so there's both within, so this is basically driven primarily by um, within occupation or within industry uh, variation. Okay, the other thing too that's interesting is that these magnitudes are significantly larger for older workers. That is, if you compare the response to the same shock, younger workers see a much smaller decline in earnings than older workers the magnitudes are larger by about 50 to 80% for older workers. And perhaps more surprisingly, these responses are larger for the highest paid workers relative to other workers in the same industry and occupation. Okay, to be clear, this is a comparison in income relative to the same occupation industry cell. It's the most highly paid workers that experience the largest declines. And you know, there's a lot, number of ways how you can rank these workers. It seems to be pretty robust how we did this. And to us, that was surprising, okay? Because a priori, you might have the view that income, some people are paid more than others because they're more skilled. All else equal, you might expect more talented workers to be better at utilizing new technology. So there's something missing in that picture. So here's uh, here's one way to rationalize this with the view of technology that's skill bias, which is they're exposed more. And in some sense, that's good for what I was saying earlier, because that means that because these guys are more likely to participate in the stock market, there's a higher chance this filters to asset prices. Uh, but we don't understand exactly why, what's the mechanism? Why, why is this happening? 
So one possibility that we came up with is that basically this is evidence for skill displacement, which is as a group, if you're skilled, you may benefit, but individual workers may lose skill as new technology improves. So going back to my Python example, people are good at coding, uh, are probably going to be better off in the fact we have better programming languages, but me, who I just can't figure a Python out, I'm going to be left behind. Another way to say this is part of my accumulated human capital is specific to a particular vintage. Okay, so then we sat down and we're at a model where that happens. Uh, so we model an, an industry, and the industry produces output using technology, low skill labor inputs, and high skill labor inputs. So this is sort of a standard construction. And the typical assumption there is that technology and low skill labor are substitutes or rather they're less complementary than high skill labor inputs and technology. And what comes out of the model then is that improvements in technology increase the skill premium, that is increase the difference between skilled and unskilled uh, wages. But then we said, well, if you're a high skilled worker, there's also a chance you get left behind. So what does it mean to have skill in this model where individual workers are endowed with theta units of skilled labor and one minus theta units of unskilled labor, that is workers supply these labor services, which is a combination of both. So their total wage earnings is gonna be a weighted average of their price for skilled and unskilled labor. So even as the skill premium goes up, individual earnings can go down if theta falls. That is the amount of skill they have falls. And why would skill fall? Because skill is specific to a particular vintage. So as technology improves, they might actually experience a loss in skill. Okay, so we sat down, we calibrated the model to try to match the, these responses of earnings across income bins. And what happens to this model, what happens to this world is that um, the top workers actually end up being uh, more exposed to new technologies than uh, the average worker. And as a result, you might think that what they want to do is they want to buy a lot of growth stocks as a hedge. And at the same time, what they want to do is they want to avoid value stocks because these are the stocks that are gonna lose value precisely when their labor income falls. So, okay. Now at this point you can say, well, not all technologies work like that, right? Sometimes firms just bring new products to market. Right? How does the new iPhone displace, displace anyone? If, they, if Apple releases iPhone 14 versus 13, no, no one actually gets displaced. So how does this translate that? And then the answer to that is, well, one has to think a little bit more than about um, how the rents are shared between the firms and workers. Uh, so that's going to be the discussion we're going to have next. But I think it's also a natural place to stop and ask and uh, think about questions. So let me pause for 15 seconds in case anyone has a question. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, seems like the earnings or the wage rights mm -hmm. keep around like uh, like 50 years ago, that's what I was told 20 years ago, I don't know the new data. Yeah, we actually got this result. You, I'm not sure you have data, right? You control for the like uh, the age, right? Oh, this, this one is controlling, zero. this can control for age. So I can compare workers that are paid different amounts. Oh, okay. And they're same age. Okay, thank you. This, is, this pattern is distinct from the age pattern. Okay. Okay, so now what we did is we saw some facts for direct displacement. Now the question is not all technology works like this. Um, so now let's think a little bit about what other channels through which uh, this risk can pass through to workers. Um, so here's one mechanism, which is uh, basically uh, profit sharing. So there's a number of mechanisms through which what's risk for the firm and the shareholders can become risk for the workers. 
um, and then you need two components. You need basically some type of labor market friction. That is, workers are paid not um, necessarily their marginal product, but there's some surplus from having a particular work in a particular firm that gets shared between uh, shareholders and workers. And at the same time, there has to be some element of profit sharing. Um, and presumably, this happens more likely to with with the best the top employees. So if firms share some of their profits with workers, then if firms lose market share, that's going to translate into a uh, loss of wage earnings for the top workers. So that's another mechanism through which uh, firm risk can pass through the worker risk. So this is uh, based on some other work I have with Larry and Leonid and Jay Song. Um, so this is a, uh, one motivating fact, which is if you look at the risk in firm profits is significantly higher in innovative industries than in less innovative industries. That is, if you zoom in and compare the dispersion in profitability between firms that industries where there's a lot of innovation versus not, you'll see that in innovative industries, there's a lot more uh, dispersion in profitability. There's a lot more turnover, a lot of more creative destruction, so to speak. And yet at the same time, in these industries, top workers face also significantly more labor income risk. There's a lot more dispersion in earnings for workers in the same industries. So that's suggestive that this is going on, but anyway, let's zoom in uh, to individual workers and see if we can see a channel. Okay, so recall that figure from the previous uh, stuff that we talked about, which is firms that innovate a lot, um, their profits go up, if the firm doesn't innovate and competitors in the same industry innovate, then the profits go down. So then the question is, how does this change in profits, change in firm cash flows translate into worker earnings? And then the answer is it does to some extent. So these are now regressions of individual worker earnings on the same object, firm innovation or competitor innovation. So what you're seeing is your own firm innovates, and as a worker, you experience higher profit growth. Whereas if other firms in the same industry innovate, you experience lower average profits. People have used the ratio between their response in profits, so the response in earnings to the response in profits as a measure of uh, profit sharing. It's that elasticity right there. And the first thing to note is that notice that it's bigger on the downside that's on the upside, okay? Which might be surprising to some if you think that what's happening is firms insuring workers. That definitely doesn't look like a lot of insurance if the firm shares more of the downside than the upside, sort of the opposite of insurance. You say, well, how does this work? Because wages are downward rigid. Well, first of all, they're not very downward rigid for the top workers, but more importantly, these wage earnings include loss in earnings that happens from separations. So if workers leave the firm, typically they get employed in a different firm at a lower wage. That's part of this year, which is part of this, why these, uh, these workers are experiencing sharper losses. Okay, the interesting thing to take away here is that these responses are larger for the top earners. So these guys are bearing significantly more of that risk than the average worker, especially on the downside. Okay, now you can say, can you say something more about how the distribution changes? Um, there's also interesting action happening in higher moments. So it's not just the average earnings growth changes. What's actually happening for these workers is that if your own firm innovates, then distribution of earnings growth becomes much more highly skewed to the right. Whereas if other firms in the same industry innovate, then your distribution becomes more left skewed. So not just that you, you're gonna get a, that everyone gets a 4% wage cut, but rather a subset of workers receive large wage declines where everyone else doesn't. Now, that means that if you're risk averse, this is much worse for you that is, if, 
things become more left skewed, from your perspective, it's almost like you're facing the larger probability of a rare disaster because losing your job here results in significant loss in earnings. So as an individual worker, uh, this looks worse to you than just a change of the mean. Okay, and then we cut this by income. And then again, we're seeing this skewness effects are more pronounced for the top earners, both on their upside, but also more significant on the downside. That is the earnings of the top workers are the ones that are particularly left skewed in response to other innovation by firms in the same industry. So then putting everything together, we said that even though there might not be any direct displacement of workers, simply because what's happening in the product market can also filter out to worker earnings. Uh, and the ones that are most exposed are workers at the top of the earnings distribution, particularly on the downside, which is basically what matters for uh, preferences. Okay. So then we kind of took all these things and then we put it into a model. Um, the model has some ingredients. I'm not going to go into details too much, but then the way what happens in the model is that firms are competing in the product market and there's some type of quality ladder going on. So firms can lose market share as other firms take the lead in a particular product. And the key element of the model is that firms share some of these rents with workers. And there are some labor market frictions, which is part of the worker's productivity specific to her working for a specific firm. Okay, so the model can replicate uh, the facts that I showed you. That is, I can run the same regressions in simulated data from the model and get quantitatively comparable magnitudes. We use those to calibrate the model. And then the advantage of the model is it can make statements about preferences and workers' willingness to hedge these risks. So it's still um, partial equilibrium in the sense that workers are taking uh, state prices as given, but then I could ask what happens to their marginal utility um, if there's a lot of innovation happening in a particular industry. So we had a lot of elements that kind of make sense. Uh, what's interesting here is the change in marginal utility. So we can see from the perspective of incumbent workers, if there's a lot of innovation happening in a particular industry, uh, marginal utility goes up. There's a lot of dispersion in who cares about it more, but in the average worker experiences a 0.4 log point increase in her marginal utility on average. Okay, to put that 0.4 log point increase in perspective, remember that this is basically the same thing as the sharp, the sharp ratio in a portfolio that's perfectly correlated with her marginal utility. Another way to say this, this is what she's willing to pay because it's an increase in marginal utility to hedge that risk. Think of it as that's her individual market price or price for this particular shop. And you can say who's willing to pay more than others. The answer is workers at the top of the earnings distribution are they on the ones that have the most to lose? That's because um, they have relatively high, work, high earnings. These workers are more exposed in both the model and the data. And as a result, their willingness to pay is significantly higher. Okay, so what happens in this model now is that you can have, in this set of models, is you can have uh, human capital being displaced by technology either directly through automation and skill displacement or indirectly because of profit sharing motives. So what's gonna happen in this model now is that there's gonna be this demand for growth stocks by younger agents. Why younger agents? Because for them, most of their wealth is human capital. So for them, this shock is particularly salient. So what they wanna do is they wanna buy, they wanna invest more in growth stocks. And older workers, most of their wealth is financial assets, so they may be happier to take more value stocks. So our conjecture is that this is actually consistent with some of the patterns that are documented in the literature between who are the value and growth investors. The people that own growth stocks are mostly young investors, at least in the data, and one 
potential explanation for that is that these workers, for them, human capital is a bigger part of the portfolio and human capital is particularly salient to displacement, either directly or indirectly. Okay, so I think that's a natural stop, uh, pause. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about intangibles more broadly. So maybe it's a good place to stop and uh, take more questions. Are there any questions? Yeah, I have a quick question. I try to understand the inclusion. So it seems all the workers, right, they are more likely to be replaced, displaced. Right. So so like they are seems like this the new technology right, has an active effect on their earnings. You're right. They but technology so have I... increased all the price, right? So I would um, so it seems like they should actually buy growth stock, right? So well, it depends, actually, right? So the thing with older workers is that it's true <laughs> their human wealth is more exposed to technology, but at the same time, their human wealth is a much smaller part of their wealth overall because they have a lot of savings that they've accumulated in financial assets. Right. And what people want is they want to hedge the total wealth. Right. So the fact that human wealth is more exposed goes against that. But at the same time, now if I'm 50 or 60 or 70, I'm not gonna work forever. Most of my wealth is in financial assets, not uh, labor income. Right. So which uh, way does okay. it go? It's unclear, but okay. to the extent that the composition effect dominates, which it probably does for some of that 70, I guess they don't care much about their human capital. Um, these people should buy value stocks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So so far, I've been emphasizing the role of technology shocks as sort of happening randomly. Um, what I want to do is I want to switch gears a little bit and think through about the firm's assets in place as being also part of intangibles. And I think that's important to think about because again, I think these intangibles have become increasingly important over time. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the way we're thinking about firms is still in the 19th century where there's a combination of uh, workers and physical assets. And you could argue that Apple today doesn't work like that. And people have written down models where there's a capital that's physical, this capital is intangible, but then typically the way we model them is really not that different from the way we model fiscal capital. That is the, the main distinguishing feature of intangibles in, the, in most models is that it just cannot be measured. So what I wanna do is I wanna take a little bit of a step back and think through what exactly makes intangibles different from physical assets from a fundamental standpoint. Okay, what, what's the key difference that makes an intangible different than a machine? Uh, so this is based on some new work that I have with uh, Jan Eberly, uh, Nico Cruze, and Andrea Eisfeld. And again, it's trying to motivate or try to understand some of the uh, properties that sometimes people ascribe to intangibles, which is the fact that they're highly scalable, maybe they serve as poor, poor collateral, or they have fixed costs. People typically assume these things. What we want to do is we want to <coughs> understand a priori what do you think the different properties would be? So here's one attempt to do that. Uh, so you can think of, okay, what is an intangible? Well, it basically starts as a piece of knowledge. Think of it as an idea. And ideas like a physical presence, okay? So ideas don't exist on their own. I mean, unless you're, you think like Plato, they, they have to be stored or live somewhere. They have to be embodied somewhere. And this could be a person if the idea is in my head, or if I have a technology for writing it down, it can also live in a document. Okay, so the first thing to start is that intangibles have to be stored in some medium. And because we have, in, in, in many cases, we can actually transmit these ideas. That is, we can store it in multiple places. That is, I can have the same idea in my head, can have the same idea written down in a book, and someone else can read the book and get the same idea in their head, which makes that idea, potentially non-rival. That is both me and someone else can have the same idea in their heads. 
which means we can also use it in production. Now, you may think that this technology is somewhat imperfect, that it's not always possible to transmit ideas. There's something that's lost in translation, in translation so we're going to allow this to, to change over time. I mean, an extreme case of this, imagine we don't have any writing, we don't have a way to write down ideas, then the only way we can transmit them is if we through language. So if you know, people, everyone dies that have this particular idea and it hasn't been told anyone else that idea dies. Okay, so this, this technology for transmitting ideas could potentially be imperfect. Uh, it could also improve over time. So we can go from writing to the internet. There's been a, there's been a rapid technological shift that changed um, the scale at which ideas can be transmitted. Now, that by itself is not enough to create an intangible asset. That is, you want to distinguish the intangible, which is an idea, from an asset, which is that idea has some private value. That is, if anyone can use the same idea, then no one's going to be able to charge a price for that. And as a result, there's no market value attached to that idea. So the only way to attach some market values by enforcing exclusivity. And that's where institutions come in, which basically um, impose restrictions on who can use a particular idea. There's a copyright, there's patent protection. And as a result, you can go from ideas that are stored in assets, is, uh, the ideas that are stored in mediums into actual intangible assets. So an example of such an institution is the patent system. Without the patent system, anyone can just read a patent and copy the idea. The fact there's a patent system and forces exclusivity, which means that patents have market values. Okay, so here's some examples. So a patent is an invention, it's stored in a patent application and the institution that enforces this is the patent system. Software is stored in computers and there's a copyright system that enforces exclusivity. There's video and audio material, it's stored in medium, in a, a tape or a DVD or a hard drive. And again, it's protected by the copyright system. An intangible way of franchise agreement, and we wrote it down in a contract, and then there's lawyers who can, and the courts are gonna enforce that agreement. That's, a, that's the institution. It could just be a list of customers, and this list of customers could be stored in data, or it could be stored in the minds of the salespeople and non-compete agreements will, or privacy are gonna enforce, uh, create some value for that. You can also think of organization capital as some type of know-how that the organization ha may have. And this would be written down in sets of processes if it's stored in uh, an external medium, or it could just live in the mind of the manager. And what enforces exclusivity there is a set of uh, trade secret laws or non-compete clauses, et cetera. And then well, there's also brand value, you can think of it in this context. It lives in the minds of consumers or in logos, and there is a trademark system that enforces that exclusivity. Okay, so here's what comes out of this framework, which is the one thing that you get is scalability. That is because the same idea can be copied and, simul and stored simultaneously uh, you can basically have uh, returns to scale. If I have an idea for a better product or sorry, a better process, then everyone can use this. And then in principle, we can expand production quite a bit. Um, but at the same time though, if I don't appropriate the full benefit of that idea, then I'll probably underinvest less. I will invest less in creating new ideas. Um, which kind of, gives you this idea that intangibles can serve as pool collateral and partly of the part of the reason that is that can be easily more easily expropriated uh, than a machine, for example. Because if I have a machine, I can enforce, I can restrict who's actually using it. And similarly, you could think of this as either expropriation or imitation. Um, both of these happen in the model. The flip side of expropriation though is spillovers. So if these ideas are easier to imitate, they might at the same time create positive spillovers, uh, which will mean that now there's a trade-off between allowing for more imitation, which will allow for more positive spillovers, while at the same time, uh, you're restricting the incentive to create new ideas. So come up with such a framework is something like 
you want to have a moderate amount of IP protection. If it's too much, it stifles innovation. If it's too little, um, it, it changes incentives to actually uh, innovate and do anything because uh, anything you do is going to get expropriated by others. And at the same time, another thing that could come up is you get this sense of fragility because unlike a machine that's still going to produce output, if a better machine is out there, because ideas are non-rival, they can become quickly obsolete by better ideas. So you have a sense through which intangibles can actually be much more fragile than physical capital. An example of that is brand value, which can be destroyed by a corporate scandal, whereas it's much harder for a firm factory to be destroyed. I mean, okay, sure, it could be an earthquake, but that's going to be a that's a much rarer event than that. Okay. So let me try to embed these ideas into some of these ideas into a model. Um, it's going to be very simple. For now, it's going to be mostly static. Um, and the way the model works is there's some entrepreneurs that decide to create new intangibles. And then once those intangibles are created, they just decide how to deploy them in production. So the key part of the model is that the same intangible can be deployed across different production streams. Okay, so S now indexes a stream of production and X indicates the measure over which uh, these intangibles are implemented. Okay, so there's a firm that now owns some intangible capital N, some tangible capital K. So K is, think of it as, could be capital, it could also be workers and then decide how to maximize their profits. So the first constraint that they face is that physical capital or workers uh, are gonna be allocated across different production streams. And here, if I allocate a machine in production stream S, I cannot allocate the same machine in production stream S prime. Okay, so machines are perfectly rival. I cannot have the same machine deployed in two different locations. The key part of the model is that intangibles are not like that. So what this basically says is that the budget constraint for allocating intangibles, if I allocate more intangibles in a particular stream, this doesn't necessarily mean that I'm gonna allocate less intangibles in other streams. That is the same intangible can be allocated to multiple places. Now, how possible is this is captured by this parameter row. So this parameter O captures the extent to which ideas are non-rival. So to understand what this is happening, look at some extreme cases. If rho is one, that means that the same intangible can be allocated without any cost on any stream. So in some sense, this is the Romer model um, on steroids where you can use the same idea for every stream. If row is zero, then ideas are perfectly rival. There's just no difference between ideas and intangibles and physical capital. And in the intermediate case where row is between zero and one, then something is lost in translation. That is the same idea cannot be effectively allocated across every single stream, but there is, they're not perfect substitutes. Okay, so then what happens to the model then is that, that that's the first part. So then there's a scale of production that gets chosen by the entrepreneur. And then what the entrepreneur is gonna do is gonna trade off the fact that if she chooses a bigger scale, then she might have to give up more rents to the outside world. So here we have in mind two different mechanisms. One is if I implement the idea at a bigger scale, there's a higher chance I'm gonna get imitated. So I'm going to lose a smaller, I'm going to appropriate a smaller share of a larger pie. Another way to think about this in terms of language is if I need to implement the idea in a larger scale, I need to uh, share some of my rents with a financier because I need to raise more money and these people are going to get, an, are going to appropriate a share of my surplus. So this Delta captures the extent to which I can appropriate the full value of the idea or not. 
So if delta is zero, then I can appropriate the full value of my idea. If delta is between zero and one, then something gets lost. Someone else gets something. It's either imitators or uh, the venture capitalist. So what happens in the model then is that the optimal scale in which intangibles are allocated is a function of these two things. So the more non-rival are ideas, the more they're going to be implemented. At the same time, the weaker institutions are, the bigger the the bigger of the fraction that the entrepreneur is going to keep for herself, which means that the ideas are going to be implemented at a lower scale. So putting that together with the incentive to create new intangibles, then if you keep a smaller fraction of the rents, you're likely going to invest less in creating new intangibles. So that's the last part of the model. Okay, so at a high level, what this has is a trade-off between how easy it is to transmit ideas versus how easy it is to protect these ideas and the entrepreneur to appropriate something for herself. So let's see how the model can help us understand some of the trends uh, we see in macro. So the first thing to do is to calculate what is TFP in the model. So then notice that output is a function of a few things. One is physical capital, okay. The other one is the scale of it, the amount of intangibles that's there. But then what also matters for TFP is the scale at which these intangibles are deployed. So any attempt to measure intangibles in the data as a stock of intangibles is gonna basically run into problems because what thing you wanna do is not just measure N, but you also measure the scale at which it's deployed, which is a function of different parameters. So maybe it's almost hopeless, right? Maybe you kind of have to measure intangibles as a residual, which is not, a, not necessarily a way to think about it. Another thing you're learning from this is that you can also think through factor shares. So this is a discussion about whether the, how is the share of output distributed to different parts of the economy? So we know that the labor share has declined. The question is whether has the capital share declined or not, or is this part of it is called profits. So you can actually do the same exercise in the model except what shows up is profits is not rents, but rather it's payments that go to intangibles. So depending who wants these intangibles, some of it is owned by the entrepreneur versus some of it is owned by others, outside investors or shareholders, you would have to allocate that profit share to different agents giving some assumptions. The model can also help you think through income inequality um, to the extent that ownership of these intangibles is concentrated, you might all helps you generate uh, cross-sectional distribution in in uh, in wealth, and also helps you think through some of the evidence about the difference between average and marginal Q. And for asset pricing, it might be relevant to think through. How is the investment returns affected once you incorporate intangibles into that equation? And the last thing that you want to think about is how do we measure rents to who exactly? Because in the model that I wrote down, there's no ex ante rents to the creation of intangibles because there's some risk, but exposed, there's some successful entrepreneurs, the Elon Musks and the Jeff Bezos of the world. This doesn't mean that ex ante, there wasn't free entry. So this has implications about how you think about the profit share again. And then the last thing we did is we took this framework and embedded it into a model of growth. And then what happens in the model is you have this now trade-off between the technology for storing and disseminating intangibles row, that is the higher row is the more non-rival the technology becomes versus the degree of IP protection, uh, which is captured by the parameter delta. And now you have this interesting trade-off, which is as you increase rho, that is, it's easier to disseminate intangibles. You have more scalability, which leads to higher growth. But at the same time, it makes expropriation more likely, which in turn lowers the incentive to create new intangibles. 
and hence lower growth. So the net effect is a bit ambiguous. And similarly, as you increase delta, that is, as you weaken the IP system, sorry, uh, if you improve the IP, if you improve pattern protection, you improve the IP protection, uh, that means people get expropriated less, therefore they want to invest more. But at the same time, this leads to lower spillovers and therefore let lower growth. So I'm going to end with some comparative statics from that model. This is the growth rate of the economy as you change uh, the degree of non-rivalry. And then you can see there's, there's a, it's a bit of hump shape depending on parameters. That is, as you make intangibles easier and more to be transmitted and more scalable, um, if you go from perfectly rival to somewhat non-rival, you can actually lead to higher growth. But you might actually come in a situation where there's too much scalability. There's, as a result, there's too much expropriation. Nobody wants to invest much in new intangibles, in which case growth will be a little bit lower. Um, and one can do similar parameter comparative stack with respect to delta, which is you can have too much or too little IP protection as far as growth is concerned. Right, this is still in work in progress. Uh, there should be a draft soon. So if you're interested, just keep an eye out. So I think it's good to pause for questions. I think Matthew has a question. Yeah, Matthew, you want to ask your question? Um, you know, it again, it's really kind of maybe more of a comment than a question, just kind of about this, um, these parameters, rho and delta, um, just sort of to, to kind of ask about how, how you're interpreting that. I think you, you, you've, you've said part of how you want to interpret that is as delta is just kind of like a scalar for uh, 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 property rights enforcement kind of strength. And then rho is sort of this like, there's something about memory loss and translation and stuff, but it's also just kind of about how, how scalable it is and everything. And my, right. comment, my comment was just that there's, um, there is some work in like just kind of economics of property rights, transaction costs kind of stuff all over. Well, there, there, particularly there's a guy, Stan Leibowitz, who's done some stuff on IP and property rights. And um, what he's finding, what, what he kind of found is that, uh, uh, you know, the transaction costs and the enforcement costs kind of influences who ends up paying for the use of the IP. Um, you know, each end user need not pay for, you know, some incremental use of IP. Um, you could just, uh, uh, so, you know, we, we read journal articles usually through a subscription through universities, right? So universities end up paying um, the publisher for the, uh, and, and instead of us individually. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at, any, anyway, uh, just kind of just kind of a comment about how proper how you know the property rights literature might kind of inform some of the interpretation here yeah that's great that's a thanks uh, okay i mean that's pretty much all i have left, i have to say um so i think there's a lot of work that's left to be done and in my view the questions i'm interested in is first i want to understand what makes a technology shock different than other types of shocks that firms face, so for example, a positive demand shock. And also what exactly makes intangibles, and by that I mean the firms accumulated stock of knowledge, different than other types of factors the firm owns, like a piece of land or a machine. Uh, so I think to answer these questions, we need both better data and better models. So I think that's your job. So that's pretty much all I have. Thanks a lot, Dimitris. This is really great. There's a lot of ideas coming out of that. As you said, lots of um, directions for future work. So hopefully that's, that's useful for, for uh, students. And um, with that, let's, let's wrap up for today since we're out of time. Um, please join me in thanking Dimitris for his great talk. And I hope to see you all back tomorrow for our last day of the MFS Summer School with uh, Laura Veltkamp. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Dimitris.